Hello everyone, I'm Julie Allen, the new executive director of the OPF. I've been on board for a couple of months now, so I'm probably a new face to most of you. Welcome to our first collaborative event with the IIPC and the Impact Center of Competence. It's great to see so many people here. Over 720 people have registered. The topic for today is preservation of digitized and born digital collections, interconnections, policies, and workflows. So to get us started, um, the reason that we've come together today, and it is really fantastic that we have the opportunity to bring three international organizations together. So some of you may be aware of one of the organizations or two, or maybe even three. But we have today the Open Preservation Foundation or OPF, that's um, Julie and Becky and Charlotte here today. The Impact Center of Competence in Digitization, that's myself and Isabel in the room. And also the International Internet Preservation Consortium or IIPC. And here we have Olga and Kelsey with us today. And uh, as Julie and uh, Becky were saying, uh, this is our first joint um, virtual panel on the preservation of uh, preservation of digitized and born digital collections. And we're going to be covering three topics today: organization, policy, and interconnections. So we've got just over an hour today. Um, we're going to have an introduction to the various themes and our panelists as well. Um, and then we'll have 15 minutes on each of the topics. So the first topic um, we'll be covering today is organizationally. So where do preservation, digitization and web and social media archiving fit into your organization? Here we've got, as uh, we were saying earlier, there are hundreds of in, in different types of institutions. The three institutions we have today, who I will introduce in a minute, are three national libraries, but we very much hope to be inclusive here and that these uh, ideas, thoughts and discussion points that we will share today, um, we hope will be for all kinds of institutions in the cultural heritage sector. Secondly, um, which policies um, cover preservation, digitization, and web and social media archiving? And finally, what are the interconnections between the different departments, between the digitization and born digital curators and the preservation teams? Do these already exist or would um, new uh, interconnections cross uh, the organization and inter-organizationally of interest. So without further ado, I would very much like to introduce our three panelists today. So firstly, we have um, Dr. Emmanuel Bermez, who is the Deputy Director for Services and Networks at the National Library of France, otherwise known as the BNF, and has been since 2014. In the course of her career, she's worked both at the BNF and also at the Centre Pompidou. Um, Emmanuel had developed expertise in digital heritage, her, also her PhD subject. She has been active in several international initiatives, including, as some of you will know, um, Europeana, the W3C, IFLA, IIPC, the International Image Interoperability Framework, and AI for LAM community. And uh, most recently, um, Emmanuel was involved in the establishment of the Data Lab, a digital scholarship service for researchers that was recently set up at the BNF. So a very warm welcome, Emmanuel. Our second speaker is Michael Day. He is digital preservation research lead at the British Library in the UK. He is a member of the team that is helping to ensure that the library's extensive digital, digital collections are preserved and made accessible for future generations. 
Michael is particularly interested in promoting a deeper understanding of the library's diverse and ever-growing digital collections and in developing the necessary knowledge and tools required to support preservation planning for digital content. Before joining the British Library in 2013, Michael worked for 17 years as a researcher and research manager at the University of Bath. So a very warm welcome to you as well, Michael. And last, but by no means least, we have Jeffrey von der Hooven, who is the head of digital preservation at the National Library of the Netherlands or the KBNL as it's sometimes known. In this role, Jeffrey is responsible for defining the policies, strategies and organizational implementation of digital preservation at the library with the goal to keep digital collections accessible to current users and to generations to come. Jeffrey is also director at the OPF, the Open Preservation Foundation, one of the core organizers today, and also a member of the steering committee at the IIPC. In previous roles, he's been involved in various national and international preservation projects, such as the European Projects Planets, Keep, Pass Insight and A Parson. So a very warm welcome to you as well, uh, Jeffrey. Without further ado, um, we'd like to introduce our first topic. So we'll have about 15 minutes to discuss our three topic areas and how this will work is that each of the speakers will have around three, three and a half minutes in order to say a little bit about um, the particular topic in their own organ in their own institution. So firstly, organization. Organizationally, where do preservation, digitization, and born digital and social media archiving fit into your organization? So firstly, I'm delighted to give the floor to Emmanuel from the French National Library. Thank you very much, Sally. So here on the screen, uh, you have the organization chart uh, of the BNF and uh, the little me uh, on the right column uh, indicates uh, my current uh, position uh, at the BNF. So I'm deputy director of um, services and networks, which covers more or less uh, what you would call technical services in a regular uh, library. Uh, so uh, the, the library services that require some technical expertise. And uh, if you look at where we stand in terms of uh, organi organizing uh, the preservation function for digital material, you can see that um, inside this unit, um, there is the IT, of course, and but there is also uh, the preservation or the conservation department, which includes um, the digitization uh, function. So we combine uh, the, the, the physical and the digital in terms of uh, preservation, but also in terms of legal deposits. You can see that in my unit, there is also the uh, the legal deposit department, which is in charge of both print legal deposit and, and web archiving. And uh, so in order to perform these, uh, these activities, uh, we work with a lot of colleagues. So that's this uh, bizarre cloud uh, on the picture. Uh, and especially in the collections directorate, which is organized according to um, different types of collections or different uh, topics. Um, and so we have uh, we have people who, uh, who are uh, correspondents uh, for the digitization, for the preservation, for the digital preservation, and for the web archiving uh, for each type or each each area uh, of of the collections. So so it's a very uh, spread organization and. Since I still have one or two minutes, uh, what I wanted to mention is that um, the, the main thing that you have uh, to 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 keep here in mind uh, is that we switched from an organization where we had all the functions that are related to digital, so digitization, digital preservation, web archiving, everything, in a very small department which was called the Digital Library Department. And we switched from that organization to a widespread organization where digital is everywhere in the library uh, in 2008. 
So I think that's quite early in terms of digital transition from the organizational point of view. And uh, it means that it's been more than 10 years, almost 15, uh, that the, the preservation, digital preservation, digitization, and web archiving functions are really uh, a collaboration between several uh, professionals at, at the library. And for me, this is, uh, this is a great achievement in terms of digital transformation for an organization. When you switch from a situation where you have a few people who are aware of this topic and able to, to manage it, uh, to an organization where um, it's decentralized and uh, all the professionals are, have a bit of digital in, in their activities. Fantastic. Thank, thanks very, very much, Emmanuel. And it, indeed, it is very interesting to already see how the digital transformation has been happening over the last few years at the BNF. So I'm very delighted to hand the floor over to Michael and to tell about the activities at the British Library. Um, hello. Um, uh, the British Library is the National Library of the United Kingdom, and it's a very large research library in its own right. It's also like the BNF, one of the um, UK's six legal deposit libraries. Uh, it has two sites. It's based partly in central London, partly in Boston Spa in Yorkshire. So from an organizational perspective, the, the library is quite a large one and it's formally structured into two main divisions with an executive. So one of those divisions covers operations, which includes things like uh, technology and reading room services, while the other one covers collections, which covers a whole range of other activities related to the custodianship of a library's physical and digital collections, as well as things like uh, collection care, collection metadata and the library's involvement in, in research more generally. Um, I mean, like, like the BNF, I mean, the library has been working in a digital space for, for some years, some decades now. So digitization activities started in the mid 1990s with the Initiatives for Access program. And this has developed now into a large portfolio of activities, which is conducted through our own studios, as well as with partnerships with others, both for commercial and research. Uh, selective archiving um, started in the mid 2000s um, with involvement in something called the UK Web Archiving Consortium, which was the first major UK web archiving activity. And since 2013, that has involved, evolved into a more comprehensive activity working with the other legal deposit libraries, um, developing a more comprehensive uh, set of collections. Um, based on an annual capture of the UK web space and as well as the forming the basis of more selective special web collections. Um, the library has many other digital collections of both digitized and born digital. These include ebooks, e journals, maps, geospatial data, personal digital archive collections, sound and audiovisual content, and uh, much, much more. So it is, is a large and complex uh, uh, collection. In terms of organization, the key point to make or the what key points I want to make is that they're very much a partnership across the whole library, which is the same as in, in the BNF. So um, the UK Web Archive involves uh, colleagues both from technology, which is in operations, as well as curatorial colleagues from contemporary British publications. Uh, digitalization involves uh, lots or lots of parts of the library. So the studios are part of, of uh, technology, but then we also have copyright experts from the library's executive and many different parts of the collections division, including curators, collection specialists, the collection care team for, for prep preparation of items, Heritage Made Digital, which is an ongoing program, uh, digital curators who have an interest in outreach, as well as the digital preservation team where I'm based. And digital preservation itself is a sort of collaboration between, across technology and, and curatorial colleagues as well. So in terms of supporting ingest functions and the library's preservation repository system. Some of the collaboration is institutionalized through internal committees. So for example, in the digitization space, we have committees for access and reuse or for digitization approvals. But ultimately, I think making all this work together is, is depends on making good working relationships across the organization as a whole. Sometimes we do that through project-like activities. So for example, working on, um, we did a project working on uh, emerging formats 
um, interactive forms of publication of the other U UK legal deposit libraries. So we we worked across the organisation on that. Um, so that involves contemporary British publications, UK web archive, as well as um, sort of collection experts and, and digital preservation team itself. In other cases, we try to develop some more informal relationships. So for example, a few years ago on World Digital Preservation Day, we held a, a sort of internal informal staff open day where we brought the teams together to talk to colleagues. And those things can be quite useful as well. We also aim to work with others outside the organization. We know we don't have all of the answers ourselves. So we work through all of all the organizations that organize this event, as well as the Digital Preservation Coalition. So I hope that gives a, a rough framework of what we do. We, 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 are, we are collaborative. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much, uh, Michael, and both collaboration within and uh, without or uh, external to the organisation. And thanks very much, Michael. Now, um, over to the Netherlands and to Geoffrey, please take the floor. Hi all, great to be here and uh, a very huge audience I've seen already. Um, I will represent the National Library of the Netherlands, as I mentioned, uh, but I'm not alone. I've got a lot of colleagues uh, on the line here uh, who, who can help on the chat uh, with questions as well. Uh, so at the National Library of the Netherlands, uh, we currently have uh, three separate business units regarding the topics we are, to we are talking about. That's on preservation, on digitization, and a specialized uh, web archiving team. But first of all, let me state there's no best way of organizing these three topics in the library. It's struggling every time. <laughs> and uh, every organization is different, of course, and, and is constantly in motion because of new challenges such as the transition to digital or due to external factors uh, as new regulations uh, come in place. Um, something we experienced ourselves as well. Since uh, 2015, our organization also got a new regulation on the public library domain. And that had a huge impact on uh, what we do. What I tried in this slide is to depict a little bit of how these three organizational things evolved in the library. And the curved line indicates the amount of attention actually my library gave to the subjects that matter. And the correlation, the different ways it was organized. So for example, digital preservation was really on a high in the early days and was concentrated in a dedicated department. But then it coped with a lack of focus for some years and preservation was somewhat absorbed actually in a more general purpose department. And research became in that period quite limited. On the other hand, you can see that mass digitization or digitization in general uh, clearly shows some sort of a, st a steady basis. First with pilot projects in the early days, then larger projects on mass digitization, and finally being a mainstream and solid uh, team as it is today. But now today, it becomes under pressure because of the transition to born digital collections and the increasing amount of time that it consumes. So it is really good, I think, to realize that this happens to any organization and with this knowledge, also try to prepare for yourself. In the next slide, indeed, uh, I would like to emphasize that we often face similar challenges. Um, and therefore, I think we should look into uh, a different way of organize, organizing things. So traditionally, we operate more or less like silos, uh, as each organization has its own goals, staff, and budget. Um, but we do know that cooperation brings us further on preservation and digitization. And in this, I've got these examples of the Open Preservation Foundation, for example, and the Impact Center of Competence, good examples of where membership organizations uh, are capable of offering shared services, maintain tools, and foster knowledge. But we can go one step further. And I think that would be thinking beyond your own organization and try to operate together to one result. In this, you embrace the best of actually all organizations that has to offer, and you can work together to one result. An example is the working group of a content development group uh, in the IPC several organizations working together to build a joint COVID collection, for example. Brilliant, Jeffrey. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. So 
any immediate reactions and I'm just going to open the chat because I've seen there is a very long contribution here. This is great from David Underdown. So let's look what it says here. So for comparison at the National Archives in the UK, we have a digital archiving department and a web archiving department, both in the same uh, digital directorate. Web archiving looks after the UK government web archive, which includes the captures of various um, official social media accounts. Digital archiving has the responsibility for managing the transfer and preservation of born digital records from the UK government departments under the Public Records Act. Wow, this is really great stuff. And, and works closely with licensing, publishing and digitization department under the Commercial Directorate. Um, then talking about the, the 1921 census of England and Wales, and we also have working on the uh, teams working on the development of digital uh, transfer of digital records, a cloud based service um, and access is very much focused in a new kind of service to provide access to case law. Wow, that sounds like an extremely interesting example there, David, thank you from the UK uh, National Archives. And just looking here, um, also um, Carrie Smith here, web archivist has many different descriptions based on job positions. What are the speaker's thoughts on technological activities experience in using web archiving tools and curatorial selection? Um, brilliant, thanks very much indeed. So um, just to think, to take this a little bit further. So I picked out three specific words related to the organizational. So firstly, from uh, uh, Manuel, I picked out, well, two words, digital transformation. Um, from Jeffries, I picked out uh, fluctuation and the sort of moving over time. And from uh, Michaels, I picked out the importance of a collaboration. So I wondered if you thought about the other three words. So if you can you say something about how those three words, um, so fluctuation, digital transformation and um, collaboration, if you think about the, the two words that weren't yours, um, can you think about if they are applicable within your own organization? So um, if I first um, go back to Emmanuel um, and see if you have immediate reaction there, please. Yeah, I think collaboration is the easiest because uh, obviously um, the more uh, we upscale uh, web archiving and uh, digital preservation in general, uh, the more it becomes uh, a work that needs collaboration between different roles, different positions. And I really like the comment about that in the chat as well, because we have more and more uh, teams with very different skills uh, that collaborate with one another uh, to deliver the, the project. So the more material you try to, to ingest uh, and preserve in your, in your digital collections, the more collaboration you get. Um, I would say uh, I'm less uh, familiar or feel a bit differently about uh, fluctuation, which would probably uh, give the impression that you are not uh, on, on a regular progress, but more like it depends. Uh, it depends what are the priorities or, or how things are, are progressing on one front or, or another. And um, yeah, I think collaboration sounds more familiar. Brilliant. Thanks very much uh, to that for that, uh, Emmanuel. Um, Jeffrey, um, uh, Emmanuel just raised that fluctuation. What does that say about an organization? And I just wondered if you would like to respond to, to that comment. How do yeah, you sure. see it from your perspective? Well, sure. It, it has a lot to do with, with external influences and the focus you, you can bring in your own organization. It's also something I will raise in the, in the next uh, topic, actually, uh, on policies. Um, but you always have to think of that uh, as it happens. Um, there are external factors you can't really predict and that overcome you. So you need to be prepared to at least be some sort of a flexibility in, in your organization to, 
to cope with fluctuation and change. Um, if I look to the, the digital transition, I think that's something um, you don't need to wait too long with because your organization needs to change. But on the other hand, you need to do it step by step. I think it's not a one big thing. You can just uh, like a big bang, change your organization in that way. You need to uh, constantly be in touch with, with the different departments and the different ways you have organized it. So yeah, that's something we, we uh, officially also are struggling with. This is, this is something of everyday business with, um, of course, on one hand, we have these the digital collections uh, uh, we acquire and preserve and, and give access to. But on the other hand, we also have to cope with the mainstream traditional <laughs> collections coming in. And that's also some, some topic that needs to be addressed. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. And I think thinking about this, the fluctuation, this COVID-19 uh, affected many of our organizations. And I'm sure some of you saw the memes on the internet, what was uh, affected digital transformation in the organization and COVID-19 was mentioned sometimes. Um, Michael, just to wrap up this session, would you like to add anything further? Yeah, I think they're all really good points and really good words. I mean, I think the, the key thing is that we don't have control over everything that's going on in the world. And we also know that the users' expectations of our organisations are also changing. So I think the key thing here is be responsive. And I, I do think I mean, from these presentations, you can see that organisations are not static. The, the divisions of the library and you know the structures are not permanent. What's important is what we do with those structures and how we deliver those services to 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 users and other other people as well. So that's what I'd like to say. That's another excellent word, Michael. Responsiveness. Thank you very much for for that contribution. We see that there's a lot of uh, questions and comments in the chat, and what um, uh, Olga and Kelsey are doing are, uh, are putting those ready for the Q&A at the end. So if I don't cover all of the questions now, we can have time to come back to those at the end. So thank you very much for this first theme. Now, we're moving beyond the, the role of the organization and the organizational structure towards policy. So here we've already seen that um, digital preservation, digitization and born digital uh, curation happen in many different departments over these three different libraries. Now let's see um, which are the policies. So where do these different topics fit into the policies of the libraries? So I'll go first back to Emmanuel and the BNF. Okay, so policy, uh, it's a big word, and um, it may cover uh, very different things. So what you have here on the screen um, is a, an overview or a selection of documents that can be considered as one way or another uh, as policies uh, that touch upon uh, the topics we are discussing today. Um, the first one uh, you see on the left, uh, the performance contract, is the contract that we sign uh, every four or five years with the Ministry of Culture uh, and defines the missions uh, of the BNF. So this contract obviously uh, includes um, things that are part of our mission and that relate to, uh, to digital collections, digital preservation, digitization or web archiving. And um, mainly uh, uh, the, the idea of digital collection has emerged uh, in, in, in this document. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very important for us because it really drives what we are doing. Then we have other and less formal uh, documents. And if you go to the far right, uh, of, of the slide, what you can see, we have, uh, um, you have all the links on this slide, but I think uh, they're going to appear in the chat as well, if you want to, to check that out. Uh, so um, what you can see on the, on the right are more uh, operational documents. So documents that are created by the staff uh, for organization purpose, for collaboration purpose between the teams, uh, or also um, to disseminate to the community because we are not working uh, on an island, we're working with others in, a different, uh, in different types of organizations, uh, including, uh, for instance, IIPC. So, um, 
so these are, are more technical and practical documents. And then in the middle, you have uh, the strategic uh, documents. And we have selected two here. Uh, the digital roadmap, we're going to enter into this a bit more in detail uh, in, the, in the third question. Uh, but um, I, I really encourage you to, to check that out because we've done the very original work on that one. It's a map, metaphorical map. Uh, of an imaginary country, which is what is what it means to the digital at the BNF. And uh, so on the map, you can see uh, different uh, cities and, and activities and, and fun drawings. So it, it's also fun to look at, but we'll dive into that later. And, and the other one uh, is the, the AI roadmap. So um, this is a document that we have produced very recently. And uh, the idea is to try to foresee uh, how we are going to work with artificial intelligence uh, in, the, in the forthcoming four or five years. So artificial intelligence is something that has an impact on almost all the activities uh, of the library. And uh, from cataloging to quality control, to uh, dissemination of the collections, uh, metadata enhancements and, and, and various things. So it's not related to one specific project. It's more like uh, this emerging technology, how we're going to integrate it uh, in the workflows or in the projects that are ongoing. Um, and uh, uh, these projects, of course, uh, include uh, web archiving, they include uh, the digitization workflow, um, the digital library Gallica, uh, and, and so on and, and so forth. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, mapping the policy landscape at the BNF for us, Manuel. So over to Michael and the British Library situation. Um, hello. Um, yes, I think, I mean, our situation is a bit similar to the BNF again, where we have many policy strategies and covering many different parts of our operations. So I think the key key point to be made is that they are sort of structured. I mean, there's a hierarchical sort of um, nature. So there's sort of public version of the library's vision, which is known as living knowledge. And that provides sort of a broad framework for strategies and policies at a lower level. Um, in general, most of the library strategies are public facing or have some public facing elements, but there's also a whole host of other sort of more detailed policy documents and guidance at a lower level, many of which are internal to the library and uh, are no less important for that. I mean, as, as I said before, I mean, living knowledge as a vision outlines several purposes for the library and they sort of cover its custodianship role, which is uh, fundamental to our work with digital and physical collections, but also covers the library's significant roles in supporting business, research, learning, culture, as well as the important international dimension of what we do. So this um, vision document was published in 2015 and will remain the current vision until next year when the library reaches its 50th anniversary. So that will be a, a, a milestone. In uh, late 2000, the living knowledge uh, vision was refreshed in response to the, the COVID pandemic, a sort of realization that we needed a response to, to that when our buildings were closed for many months at a time. And so we developed a new document called Living Knowledge for Everyone, which had sort of a sort of renewed focus on the library's role in supporting um, economic growth and innovation and uh, social and cultural renewal. So while a vision document like Living Knowledge can provide a general framework, there's still a need for, for strategies and policies at, at a lower level to enable to sort of identify priorities or to inform practice. So um, we recently updated our content strategy, which is called Enabling Access for, for Everyone, so it explicitly links to, to the, the vision document. And this focuses on our, sort of our current collection requirements for, for published content or contemporary published content. And this all builds on the thing we do with, with you know, legal deposit collecting. And uh, it's important to recognize that a lot of our uh, role in around legal deposit and things is defined by government regulations. So that's another layer of our policy and uh, strategy, which is sort of uh, we, we are subject to. 
And the library also has a digital preservation strategy, which is, I think its prime aim is to make it clear within the organization and outside that digital preservation is a shared responsibility across the organization, which in some ways takes us back to what I said in the organizational um, section of this, uh, of this panel. So at a, at a lower level, we have lots of other policies and guidance covering all sorts of different things. And I'm not going to go into them in, into, into a lot of detail here, but they do cover things like the um, access and reuse of the library's collections, both physical and digital, uh, collection care policies, as well as things like um, things on open access or the use of unique, unique identifiers. And they also include things like digitalization te technical standards, which I've used as an example here. So broadly speaking, they're hierarchical and they're, but they're based in a, a vision of what the library's roles are. Wonderful. Thank, thanks very much, Michael. And I think you talked there about shared responses, shared responsibility across the different departments. But also, interestingly, I really liked how um, COVID-19, you re again returned to the responsiveness of the policy documents. So you were able to bring that into the British Library's policy and update things as a response there. So that was wonderful. Thanks. Thanks very much. And Jeffrey, how are things policy-wise in the Netherlands? Sure, I'd like to update you on that. Um, a bit similar, I think, to the BNF and, and the BL, although I think we do have well, a little bit less uh, strategy documents and, and policies, but we do have them. Uh, so as, as said earlier, the amount of attention for preservation, web archiving, and digitization fluctuates over time. It's somehow something that, uh, that touches me. <laughs> Um, and sometimes it's, it's even heavily in such a way that it even it hampers important tasks uh, or well, bring tasks at risk we need to, 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 to perform. So I think to overcome this, uh, we see actually policies, strategic documents, or even external audits, or some kind of instruments that can help to keep remembering the organization what and how things uh, should be done uh, and keep us focused. So it's not only things uh, to plan ahead or look forward, but also to create some sort of a stepping stones based on previous learnings. So in our situation, uh, we every four years generate a, a new policy plan, uh, which you can see here. And the, the links to it will be uh, probably sent in the, in the chat. Um, and uh, by doing so, we, we make sure Digital preservation of these digital collections are always part of this plan as the first step. And based on that foundation, we work to, to improve the, the, our content strategy, uh, including new goals, uh, including also web archiving, for example. And on top of that, we create a preservation policy. So, um, that's actually the, the, the core, I think, of the organization. And um, having this in place, uh, last year we, we earned the Core Trust Seal Certificate, um, which states that, uh, that based on the requirements we showed, our EDPO has officially become a trusted digital archive. But this is all not a one-time event. Um, this can be constantly improved and will change. So therefore, we also look in a some sort of called uh, plan, do, check, act cycle. Um, after doing, we check and force ourselves to readjust the policies and the plans, uh, for example, for each two years. Um, and the CTS, the Core Trust Seal Certificate, needs to be reviewed every three years. So that keeps us sharp and uh, we need to uh, be up to date on that. Um, so by doing so, we hope that the amount of attention on these three subjects also remains stable or even will grow over time, which is actually the curve showed in the, in the diagram. So that's actually uh, how we do it uh, in, in the library. Great, Thank, thanks very much. And your talk, Jeffrey, has inspired um, some of the questions in, in the chat as well. So immediate reactions to policies. I think I, what I would like is to take um, some of the um, links, some of the questions from the chat and try to transform it into a merged question to all of you. So I think, uh, is it, and apologies for the names, uh, Raza um, from the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision earlier talked about how experimentation and research and development feeds into organizational uh, activities. And the Alf Figi 
um, talked about um, the technical and legal challenges experienced. So these are both two things that I think can be taken together. So one, experimentation, but then taking into account uh, changes in ethical, legal things. So for example, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Policy, um, how do you deal with these kind of things in the policy environment? So A, how do you put policies into practice? I always get this wrong, but plan, act, do, and uh, review, something like this from Jeffrey's last slide. But what is the interrelationship between external factors, experimentation, and putting things into operation? So maybe I can again first go back to Emmanuel um, to see um, what you would like to add there. Uh, there are lots of things in your question, Sally. <laughs> so it's probably a bit challenging uh, for me to answer, answer everything. But um, maybe I can put the emphasis on, uh, again on artificial intelligence, even if it's not related directly to our topic. Uh, I have to say that working on this specific area of technology um, has forced us over the last two years or so to really um, have a closer look at certain things that I think will benefit uh, the overall question of managing IT policies uh, at the BNF. And of course, one of these questions that will be benefit more generally um, to, to the area of digital material uh, is uh, the question of ethics. So how do we relate to, to privacy, data privacy, uh, to um, the risk of having BAs in the data and also to uh, env environmental impact uh, of, uh, of digital activities. So um, in, inside our world map for AI, we have decided to work on this and to create a charter for uh, an ethical uh, digital environment at the BNF. Uh, so this is on our to-do list for, uh, for this year. Uh, we are going definitely to work on that. And we have, uh, uh, we have a conference at the end of the year with uh, other French colleagues. So it will be very, uh, very interesting, I think. Um, and uh, of course, experimentation, R&D is another area uh, where it's very important to experiment. If you want to conduct some uh, projects uh, with artificial intelligence, uh, you really have to work with uh, research. Uh, so building projects uh, with uh, academics, with the IT researcher uh, has, been, has been a great experience for us uh, over all these years working with the digital uh, material uh, and especially the last few years working on artificial intelligence. And, and experimentation is really one way to go from planning to action. So you start by experimenting small it makes you more uh, certain of the use cases that you have designed, and then you can grow them uh, into actual uh, transformation of your of your information system. And then you have to take into account the ethics, of course. Wonderful. So from those very different themes, you managed to pick out some great ones. So AI, the ethical aspects, and then experimentation. And we can come back to that broader topic of research access to collections later. Um, are there anything immediately you want to add, either Michael or Jeffrey, um, or um, how should we move on to the next section? I just say something quickly that, I mean, I think with these external challenges, which we can add things like, uh, uh, racial justice and environmental sustainability. I mean, I think the question is how proactive do we need to be and whether we just respond to what's happening elsewhere, or whether we can try and build in some, some kind of capacity, internal capacity, so we can actually be proactive in terms of responding to that. So we're not just constantly chasing you know, external requirements. I think that's an extremely, extremely important comment. Thank you, Michael. Right. We're already on the last section. I can't believe that already. So here, we're looking at the interconnection. So if we think we've looked at the organizational structure, we've seen how digital preservation, digitization, born digital is spread in different corners of the um, 
organizations. We've also seen how the inter connection between the policies, uh, either at the strategic level of, for example, BNF's um, agreement with the Ministry of Culture, right down to um, policies related to the certification of digital repositories. So we've seen a, a great um, variety of um, both policy and organizational aspects. Now we'd like to turn the focus to interconnections. So particularly in terms of the members of staff, so where are the interconnections between, for example, digitization experts, born digital curators, and then the preservation teams that are probably preserving both types of content. Um, are these um, interconnections already existing or where do you see there may be um, benefits of uh, introducing new interconnections? So again, back over to Emmanuel for the BNF. Okay, and as promised, we're going to jump into this uh, poetical metaphorical map. Uh, I, I took the French version here, but you do have an English ver version in the links that, um, that were, were put in the chat. So um, I think the main areas where you have uh, actual interconnections are the two uh, that are on, on the screen here. Uh, one is uh, collection uh, processing. Uh, and in the middle of collection processing, uh, you can see uh, that you have SPAR, our digital preservation system. And I think the first uh, big decision that we took that created an interconnection between uh, preserve, uh, digitization and born digital material uh, was the decision to have one preservation repository uh, that would uh, preserve them all. Uh, so um, so it, it, it has a different kind of impact, but uh, I think in terms of strategy, uh, one of the big impact that it has is that uh, now uh, digitization is also uh, considered as a way of preserving collections uh, within, within SPA. The second area that I've selected is the area of access. Um, of course, uh, it's uh, at the moment uh, very different uh, to, uh, to view uh, ancient manuscripts that are digitized in the digital library and to, uh, and to view uh, archived websites uh, in the Wayback Machine or in the Open Wayback. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's really a different experience, but it has some common grounds. Um, and more and more as we are getting um, born digital material uh, from different workflows, um, apart from web archiving, we are trying to integrate them in the Gallica Intramuros, which is um, the um, on-premises version uh, of our digital library Gallica. So it's the version of Gallica that has uh, copyrighted material. And then um, we have created, as Sally mentioned at the beginning, we have created the data lab, which is a, a structure for researchers and academics who want to work on the digital collections, and ex especially if they want to do uh, text and data mining, uh, they will come to this, uh, to this place, because it's a physical space. Uh, and uh, the data lab embraces all the digital collections. So um, the born digital collections, the web archives, uh, digitized collections, and also uh, audiovisual material that has been uh, digitized as well. So these are the two main areas, but you can see at, at the bottom that I've also selected some drawings from the same map. And these drawings uh, symbolize uh, three different areas where there are also strong in interconnections. The first one is infrastructure. Of course, you need a strong IT if you want to manage uh, all this. Uh, the second one uh, is the um, metadata cataloging, but in a very broad sense. And uh, the third one is artificial intelligence. I've talked a lot about it, but both are related. And one of the nice things that you can do with artificial intelligence is extract metadata from uh, big masses of uh, raw digital content. And that's one of the things we want to do in our roadmap, uh, try to extract metadata from uh, mass of digitized, born digitized material, uh, that maybe are not cataloged like the web archives and inject them uh, into the traditional catalog so that uh, they, are, they are better accessible for, for the public. That's it for me. Thanks. 
Wonderful. Thanks very much. And I think you've really helped us navigate through this, this um, digital roadmap, the different kinds of interconnections you have at the BNF already. So, Michael, over to you and the British Library. Um, yes. Uh, hello again. Um, as I say, I think this um, session has demonstrated that there are lots of interconnections between the, those involved in the collection management and preservation of digital and born digital collections. So um, as we don't have um, unlimited time, we just wanted to focus really on two main topics. So first, just really to acknowledge something I've said before, which is the importance of us all working together, both within organisations, but also with the wider communities of practice. And I think especially important, you know, over the past you know, decade or so, there's been an increasing amount of specialization in the domains that, that is covered by this sort of this virtual panel. So um, sort, of the, the, sort of the professional practice and research disciplines around web archives, digital scholarship, digital preservation, et cetera, mean that they're sort of developing in their own sort of professional way, in their own spaces, in their own conferences, potentially their own journals and sub-specializations, and their own skills needs, which roles, you know, which has um, demands in terms terms of uh, library schools and archive schools and, and, uh, uh, and that, that agenda. And then we could also add to that related areas like research data management, which we haven't really covered in you know, much today, but again, has a, has a strong link in, in with some of the activities we're doing. So I think this um, professionalization, specialization is positive, but it's important that we are able to keep in touch with what others and what's going on elsewhere. I think there's things we could definitely, things we can learn from each other. And there's ways we can, we can learn things, keep up to date I uh, just wanted to highlight things like the blogs that we produce at the British Library so we have a, a blog for the UK web archive as well as the digital scholarship blog so we you know, we talk about some of the things we're doing there and they're quite, it's quite an important way to do it and I think more generally so sort of technologies but perhaps more importantly users expectations of technology and and our collections are also changing rapidly and I think that's we really need to be Again, as I said earlier, proactive about keeping up to date with what's happening in that area and as well as in our, our own areas of professional expertise. And that sort of brings me to my sort of second and final point. And is that, I mean, I think that the reason we, we to work with collections is that we want to make them accessible and available for use and reuse. And um, we're lucky at the library to have uh, an excellent digital scholarship team who are always look, looking out for new way, innovative ways of using our collections and develop productive relationships with researchers as well. And so there's a couple of projects um, which I wanted to highlight. One is the British Library Labs, which have been doing a lot of work in, in just in that in trying to make use of the digital uh, the library digital collections, as well as sort of projects, research projects like um, Living with Machines, which is looking at how you can use sort of mass digitized content to look at particular themes in, in the digital humanities. So I'll say the main point that I really wanted to make was that, you know, providing access to users is the main reason we're doing all this stuff. And that's what I wanted to really finish with. So thank you. Fantastic, Michael. And I, I, I do think uh, this is extreme, is extremely important. I mean, why we are doing it uh, for everything that we're doing here for. Thank you very much, Michael. Now, Jeffrey, um, how are things in the Netherlands? I, I spoke uh, about business units and how to sustain our focus and activities in the organization. But I think as the previous speakers also pointed out that the interconnections are even more important. It is the people, of course, that make the organization and uh, good cooperation between the people across different teams will make the difference in the end. So the key question uh, I was thinking of is who should be in contact with who, actually? Uh, this is an area, of course, we ourselves constantly are readjusting and, and uh, therefore it needs constant attention. But I will try to make it concrete and, and concrete as much as possible I can, because from our practice, we learned that certain roles within the library has become vital of being the glue between the different teams. Um, with regard to preservation, web archiving, and digitization, I identified actually uh, four roles of what I think is currently really crucial in the library. Not stating that any other role is not important, but these are actually kind of the interlinks between the different teams. And, First of all, I would say the, the digital preservation officers, as we have, these are the people 
who focus on the authenticity and the integrity of our collection at all time. We have the metadata specialists, uh, ones with extensive knowledge about metadata standards, practices, and how it is used and applied in uh, our organization. The collection specialists, these are the persons uh, with good understanding of the intellectual side of a collection, and also often have a good understanding of uh, how the collection is used by researchers, for example, or other audiences. And finally, the product managers. Uh, these people actually ensure that the tools and services match with what the users expect from it. They maintain it and constantly improve these services. So as said, many other roles are involved, of course, and are really important uh, to have in place. Um, but I think with these four elements uh, being the glue between, for example, a web archiving team and research, or between the IT department and the acquisition department, we really make the difference. Then you've got other factors not mentioned, I think, yet, but to, to take into account. Um, for example, uh, working agile is currently a hot topic, uh, such as Scrum or Kanban. This introduces a new, uh, a new roles, actually, like product owners and Scrum masters. Um, but we should stay focused also on the more, uh, let's say, more um, uh, information-related uh, uh, roles, like the preservation officers and the collection managers. Um, nevertheless, what everybody has in common um, is that we treat our collections following what we call a content life cycle approach. That's what you see at the, the right. Digital collections uh, being digitized or digital or harvested from the web need constant attention uh, to prevent that digital black hole and make sure that they will remain reusable and understandable over time. And these four elements actually is a Form a cycle which uh, constantly will be uh, will be going over. Um, so that actually is uh, a slight insight of how we uh, see the interconnections between various teams and and roles within the library. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And I think this is great how you've said who needs to talk to who, and then how it interrelates, and also it, with the content life cycle management in in as a whole, which is wonderful. So interconnections, um, how, what are the immediate reactions uh, to that? And I just wanted to cover before we go on to the main Q&A, we've got a time for a, 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 little, a, a little intervention here. We've talked about the different types of collections. We've talked about the different kinds of users. And we've talked about the different skills needed. Um, in what ways um, do you think these interconnections need to be fostered? And by that, I mean, do you think there are individual, there are um, needs for individual training or um, uh, team development or, or kind of inter inter-team activities that need to happen in order to foster these interconnections? Um, and how, if that is the case, how might you go about that? Or how have you already been going about that? So Emmanuel, maybe I could come back to you. So how do you foster these interconnections and are there any training or skills needs in, um, related to that? I would say uh, pretty much like in any other area of the library, uh, we do need um, project management processes and things like that, uh, uh, dedicated meetings, uh, an organization that makes it possible to work in, in a transverse form. But it's not specific to the to digital. It's more specific, I think, to, to, to working in a in a big organization with uh, several hundreds of people uh, that have to, to share the, the tasks. Um, an interesting thing that I've been uh, inclined to see recent, to, to discuss recently uh, is the question of training. And um, how do you train uh, the librarians or, or the archivists uh, into being able to manage a uh, bond digital collection or digitized collection? What skills? Uh, they need. And it, it seems that more and more we both need to have some uh, digital components 
in the training of these professionals, but we are also seeing uh, other kind of professionals that are emerging. And currently we, we, call, we call them data engineers, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's exactly the, the right term. Um, but uh, these are people who have technical skills and uh, collections related skills. And we used to consider them uh, like hybrid profiles. Um, but I think we are mature enough now to think that these are not hybrid, these are real new profiles that we need in, in our organizations. Excellent. So the future of data engineers is with us. Uh, thanks very much, Emmanuel. Michael, how would you like uh, to respond to this? It's an interesting, interesting question. And I say, I think I mentioned earlier, we try to develop sort of informal ways of working. But I think one, one thing we we probably could do more of is, is research engagement. So involvement in external research projects or internal projects, which again is a good way of working together on particular um, topics. I mentioned the work we did on emerging formats, for example, where so these are interactive based publications and working with the other legal deposit libraries in the UK, we sort of devise or looking at app based content or some interactive web stuff. And that involved some quite interesting connections made across the library. And that was quite useful on a personal perspective. And, and you know, um, those, those sort of activities can be really helpful. I think just to add, I think we also have a active digital scholarship training program within the organization. Some of that stuff is external, some of it's um, purely internal, but I think that can be quite useful in explaining to people concepts around data mining, use of data, use of collections of things, and that can be a really, really, really good thing to have if you don't have one. And um, and yes, and I think I think that's you know, the two things, really working in research, we're researching together, looking for external funding, and um, digital scholarship training and stuff. We do do our own digital preservation training as well. So we do try to inform people in the library what we do and what digital preservation is, which is always a challenge, but yeah. Brilliant, thank you very much. So both internal training and um, collaboration outside of the organization. And anything you would like to add at this phase, Jeffrey? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of me have, has, has been said already, um, Indeed, awareness raising in the organization is important um, and training. Um, we do that in the Netherlands we, with what we call the, the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, which provides us uh, different courses on that. Um, but I was uh, still looking at the question uh, in, in a chat about uh, the, the librarians, the archivists and technologists. Uh, uh, I think in this new world, we all are a, a new kind of a librarian from the librarian perspective. Um, as as um, the huge amount of collection also represents a lot of data, structural data, which, which creates new possibilities, as Manuel already said on, on AI or, for example, on uh, text and data mining. So looking from that perspective, um, I think um, if you look at the, the, the software developers, the engineers on that, the uh, content analysts are actually the new librarians. And that's also how I would like to approach it in, in our library. Um, so in some sense, that's the words have not been mentioned in, in the slides, but I think it's in there. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, so we'll have time for only about two, I'm afraid. But let me start with um, the one from Amy Cowood. Um, this is a really interesting discussion, but it's not easy to see. So this is going to be quite a challenging question, but we did kind of prepare for this in advance. We realize there's three large scale national libraries in the room. Um, but um, uh, Amy said that she works at the National Health Service. So these are like health libraries um, uh, in uh, our hospitals, for example, in the UK. Or um, And um, how could we help or how could we think of these kind of activities in smaller institutions? So could you think of ways that are um, that you have develop methods or ways of working that could be useful to smaller institutions here. Um, maybe Emmanuel, um, do you have some ideas already? Yeah, I was taking note on this question because I really like uh, <laughs> this, uh, this, uh, this view, this perspective. 
Uh, and I think there are there are three ways uh, we can scale to smaller uh, organizations. The, the first one is that uh, smaller organizations won't need to experiment as much. Uh, maybe I'm I'm now joining Jeffrey with this fluctuation for, from the beginning, but we've we've been doing a lot of test and error um, progress. Uh, and once it's done by by us uh, in big organizations, uh, we more or less know where to go uh, now, I think. So we can share that with smaller institutions and they can go straight to the point. They don't have to go through all this big experiment and sometimes fail uh, stage. The second one is trying to mutualize uh, the realizations that we've done. And at the BNF, we are mutualizing our digital preservation systems so people can just uh, give us material to preserve. We are also mutualizing uh, the digital library. So if they don't have the means to create a digital library on, on their own, they can send us uh, their digitization and we will display it online for them. And the third one, it's the data engineer profile. So uh, if you look at how you, you create a team if you don't have enough people, different people to have different skills, uh, it's good to know that currently we are training young professionals that have both uh, skills on collections and, uh, and some technical skills, and they can do many things, if, even if you have just one of them. Excellent. Uh, three excellent suggestions there, Emmanuel. Thanks. Thanks very much. Michael, what are your thoughts on this? It's a very good question and and one which I think we should maybe think more about. I mean, one of the things we realise working at the British Library is that other organisations look to us for good practice and things. So it's, it's good for us, I think, to be able to explain what we've been doing, explain, you know, you know what things we think are good, what things we think are bad. And, and you know, we're not always um, set up to do that very well, you know, in terms of outreach. So I think we need to we need to be thinking about that a bit more. I think there's things, you know, from the organizational point of view, there's often challenges that we we don't face or face in a different way. For example, getting access to technology or being able to install tools, digital preservation tools, for example, web, web harvesting tools on, you know, a small organization with a very tied down, maybe, maybe outsourced IT infrastructure. This is very, very difficult. And I don't know how we, you know, address all of those challenges you know, individually. I think um, one thing we can do as a library, we, we, we are hopefully we're open to you know, talking to people, working with people. One example being, for example, the special collections we do through the U UK Web Archive. So we work with lots of external organisations to collect, you know, web, you know, to make sure that the UK Web Archive includes, you know, sort of web collections in certain areas, including healthcare. So I think there are things we can do, but I think it's something we do need to be aware of far more. Absolutely, I 100% I agree with that, uh, Michael. Jeffrey, what would you like to add on this? Yeah, a couple of ideas actually uh, that have come around and uh, also have been uh, practiced. Um, in, for example, um, I just mentioned the organizational networks uh, um, approach. Uh, we have the Dutch Digital Heritage Network in the Netherlands, and we have to deal also with, with many smaller organizations, voluntary uh, organizations. Um, and we, we have uh, instated um, uh, what we call um, heritage coaches. Um, these, these coaches actually come along and uh, see what actually is the, the big question uh, small organizations are dealing with and how they could be uh, helped actually by more larger organizations such as libraries or national archives. But that's one approach um, um, it, it, that really seems to work out. Uh, uh, we get questions from these coaches and, uh, and can answer it and uh, vice versa. I see that the smaller organizations seem to be uh, very pleased with, with the support they get. Um, another way around is, is what we use in the public library domain is, is the principle of trained trainer. So you have, uh, well, the trained one person and that is able to also speak up and uh, give the word through to, to the other uh, people in the organization. And from then on, it's uh, the, the knowledge, the awareness raises and the skills uh, hopefully also uh, uh, come with that. So these two approaches maybe could, could help uh, to tackle this, this issue. Brilliant. And I can't believe it, but we've got um, only two to three minutes left. 
so we can't unfortunately go through all the very rich questions in in all the chat but um that we'll come back to this at end but maybe we need another follow-up webinar based on this because it's clearly a lot of discussion and very valuable topics so just to finalize um You've come here and you've shared all your experiences, but we really hope that you've also learned something from being part of this webinar. So for each of the panelists, um, what is the key takeaway that you have from this webinar that you would like to go back to your organization and put into action? So maybe uh, Emmanuel, um, if I could go over to you first again, please. Yeah, thank you, Sally. I, I will be very short. I really like the discussion that we had on the positions and and profiles, uh, the view that, that Jeffrey has proposed uh, of how these different profiles interact and, and the nice question that we had in the chat. So remember to, to also use the traditional uh, words like librarians and archivists when we're talking about this stuff. And I think it's really important. Great. Thank you, Emmanuel. Michael. Um, hello, yes, I mean, I think my main takeaway is that we, we certainly don't have all of the answers, we don't even always know all of the questions, but if we work together and are inclusive, then we can get somewhere, hopefully. Oh, that's a great one to finish. And Jeffrey, the last word is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was thinking of, of making sure that the different disciplines in, in your organization uh, really speak with each other. Um, I think the lower the barriers, the better people cooperate, uh, have new ideas, and work together with a much better end result. Um, and the other thing is, is don't forget to contact your network, <laughs> what we're doing here in the, on this stage. So great, thank you. So thank you very, very much. Um, to all our panelists, to Emmanuel Bermez from the, the National Library of France, Michael Day from the British Library and Geoffrey van der Hoeven from the National Library of the Netherlands. Thank you very much and um, see you soon. Thanks everybody, bye. Bye bye.